Thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. So I'm going to take you all back with me about 15 years, and we're going to go back down my memory lane to Ilm Tree, the homeschooling cooperative that Mariam just mentioned. And I was uh, one of the language art teachers at Elm Tree, and I taught all the way from, I started with third grade and I went all the way to eighth grade. I taught all the grades there. But one of the jobs I also had at Elm Tree was to go into the preschool room every day and read picture books for half an hour to the three and four year olds. And there's this one little girl who has always stood out in my mind for the past 15 years. She's in college now, mashallah. And she would be sitting in the preschool circle, and when I would read picture books to the group, I had her full attention. She would be completely focused, she wouldn't fidget, she wouldn't make any noise. She would be able to ask, answer very intelligent and deep questions that were asked of the group. She would answer intelligently, and she would be able to predict what was going to happen next. She was able to discern what the message of the story was. And that really blew me away because I knew that this little girl, her mother, didn't speak much English. She had only been in the country a few years and she was still learning English. Now, alhamdulillah, she speaks English just fine. But at that time, Eng English was a bit of a challenge for her. So I was really fascinated to know why this little girl was so attached to books and had a good grasp of books. Whereas the other children in the group whose parents were born and raised here, they had a harder time focusing. So I asked her father, and her father told me something very interesting. He said that every single day, he read three picture books to his daughter. He would go to the library, he would pick out books that he chose, or he would pick out books from his own childhood that he remembered enjoying, and he would read her three picture books. And we were seeing the results of that in the classroom, in that preschool circle. And that is something that pretty much every language arts teacher can assessed, attest to. I've been teaching language arts now, mashallah, for over three decades. And in the past 30 plus years, me and all the other language arts teachers, we have noticed the same things again and again. We have seen that students who have high levels of vocabulary, students who are able to write complex sentences, students who have a really good grasp of grammar, students who are able to figure out the deeper motivations behind what characters are doing in books, all of these students, what they had in common was that they were avid readers. They were prolific readers and they were being read to at home and they were reading constantly themselves. So in the late 1990s, we saw an uptick here in the United States of America and even around the world, but it started, like Amira mentioned, from the US. And in the late 1990s, the book publishing industry saw a huge, steep, what would we call it, slope go up in book sales. And um, the book publishers were doing really well and books were flying off the shelves. And stores like Borders and Barnes and & Noble were very, very popular in the late 1990s. And social scientists have studied this phenomenon to find out what was happening in the late 1990s to make so many people be attached to books. And they pared it down to three different factors that were happening at that time. The first factor that they give credit to is Oprah Winfrey. They said that Oprah Winfrey, uh, when she started her book club on her show, a lot of kids today, even you know, young adults wouldn't know who Oprah Winfrey is, but at that time she had the most popular daytime talk show, and she was very passionate about books. They say on average she would read three books over a weekend, is what I read about her. And so she would just really passionately discuss books that she really enjoyed, and those books overnight would become bestsellers. Andrew, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, it's either Dubus or Dubu, but An Andre Dubu, who wrote The House of Sand and Fog, he said that Oprah Winfrey single-handedly saved him from poverty. He was very, he was struggling. He was a struggling writer, nobody knew about his book. She read it, she recommended on her show, and overnight he became a multi-millionaire best-selling author. The second factor, they say, is in the late 1990s about what made books really popular, is that the world was introduced to a young man named Harry Potter. 
Harry Potter blew all the theories out of the water. J.K. Rowling created this character, introduced him in 1997. People at that time were saying, no child is going to read a 500 plus page long book. And Harry Potter proved him, uh, proved all those theorists wrong. Ch children were willing to stand in line for hours to buy 500 uh, plus long page books. And the third factor that they saw in the late 1990s is that the internet became very popular and books and articles and magazines were suddenly accessible at the touch of a fingertip and all of a sudden people had access to books even in the remotest villages and towns. So what we see from that is that if people show enthusiasm for books the way Oprah Winfrey did and they're excited about books, it's contagious. And if people know that they're not going to be tested and they're not going to be quizzed they're just going to have discussions about books. They're going to be more willing to pick up a book and read it. I still have peers who will tell me, like when I mention that I love the book Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, I have a friend who said, oh my god, I hate that book. And I asked her why, and she said, oh, our teacher made us analyze that book to death. And I had to write like three papers about that book. I, I, I just remember hating it. And that's often what happens. A book can be analyzed to death. Most people just want to have discussions and enjoy books. The other thing we saw is that if you have good characters and good stories, people are going to be willing to pick up a book and read it, even if it's more than 500 pages long. And the third thing we saw from the internet is that if books are accessible, people are going to read them, if they're easy to get to. Now, there's a very inexpensive reading kit that I can tell you about that everyone here can have in their own homes so that they can create an environment in which their children are going to want to read. So the reading kit, you just think of the three Bs, the three Bs. The first B is books. Every child should own their own books. Yes, you should go to the library, and yes, it's fine to go to used bookstores, but every child should also have pristine copy of their own book that they can write their name in and that they keep for themselves. And they should have access to books. The second B is book shelves or book baskets. So in their bedrooms, every child should have a book basket next to their bed or a bookshelf in the room in which they can display their books and show them off. And the third B is bed lamp or a book lamp, and that was one of the little prizes that the, the kids got for answering questions, at getting a, a book light. So at night, uh, all the kids should be told after they've done their prayers and said their orad and read their Quran and they've brushed their teeth and they've gotten into bed, they should have a little book light or a bed light next to their bed, which can allow them to read their books for like maybe another 10, 15 minutes before they have to go to sleep. And what happens with that is that these children then get to associate coziness and comfort and the safety of their home with the environment of reading books. Now, how do you know if you are successfully raising a lifelong reader? Every single student, if that student can answer these three questions you with a with, with a response, then you know that you are raising a reader. The first question you ask is, what is the last book that you read? The second question you ask is, what are you reading right now? And the third question is, what do you want to read next? If the children can answer these questions, you know that you have got a lifelong reader, inshallah. Now, how do we create an environment where children actually want to read? Studies have shown that the primary factor for success for children wanting to read is if they are coming from an environment where reading is being role modeled. So the adults in the home are reading as well, not just the children. And, that, and we're not talking about reading on your laptop or on your phone. Every adult should have a book. There should be a stack of books on your coffee table in your family room that you're making your way through. And your kids, kids should see that you power down your phones, you turn off the TV, and you, know, you sit around and you read books. And it's a contagious... Uh, contagious feeling to, to want to, it's infectious to want to read when you see people around you reading. And the second thing that kids need to see is they need to see respect and reverence for books. So 
we should be teaching our children how to handle books, that you don't get them dirty, you don't throw them around, you don't um, put them on the floor, right? And you don't scribble on them, you don't dog ear the pages. Now, what are some of the benefits that we see in children who read avidly? So some of the benefits we see, well, the primary benefit that I see in all my students who are prolific readers is an incredible grasp of a high level of vocabulary. I have a niece who, when she was six or seven years old, her little brother, who's three years old, was doing something naughty. And she looked at him and she said, he is such a rapscallion. And all of us were like, rapscallion? Where did she get the word rapscallion from? And we found out that her mom at that time was reading Huckleberry Finn to her, and that's where she learned that word. I have another friend whose son, she gave him permission to go into a, a room to get something, and he just turned to her and said, oh, I can just go in there at will? He was five years old. I can go in there at will? And she found out that he was reading a book that was a British book, and that's how they spoke, so he picked that up. I have a student I was teaching just the other day, and we came across the word disparage. And I asked him, do you know what disparage, and he's an avid reader. And I said, do you know what disparage means? And he's like, um, doesn't that mean to disdain things? So he responded with another equally high level word. Um, I had another student who uh, we came across the word dismal in a book and I asked her, do you know what dismal means? And she said, doesn't that mean dreary? But my, one of my favorite stories, however, is this young girl that I taught last year who was in the fifth grade. And this girl inhales books, inhales them. And one of my biggest challenges of teaching her was finding a book that she hadn't read. And it, it, it actually got very embarrassing. She was in the fifth grade. She had already read Frankenstein. She had already read Pride and Prejudice. It got to the point that she was willing to read a book again just so I could have a chance to read it for the first time, her teacher. So we were reading Johnny Tremaine. And in Johnny Tremaine, it described that the soldiers, they were walking down the road, and they had a gimlet-eyed stare. And I was like, gimlet-eyed stare? I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Let, let me, hold on, let me look that up. And she's like, oh, 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 I know. I was reading a book the other day, and in that book, they, they talked about a gimlet. And a gimlet is a drill that bores holes in metal. So it must mean that they have a piercing stare. <laughs> That's literally what gimlet I'd meant. OK, so high levels of vocabulary. That's what comes from reading, the primary thing that we see. It also lowers levels of aggression. Studies have shown that, especially in boys. It, it calms them down. It trains children in high levels of focus. We're in an age of distractibility. And with a book, you are sitting there, and you are focused, and you are reading. It teaches kids about the world around them. If a child is sitting there, and he hears his dad and his friend talking, and they're talking about some savvy investor in stocks, and they say, oh, that guy, he has the Midas touch. A kid who has read the book, King Midas and the Golden Touch, will understand what it means if somebody who's investing in stocks has the Midas touch. It means everything they touch turns to gold, right? They do well. So it teaches children about the culture and the world around them. So how do we introduce books to children? This is what I like to do, and I am going to have Mariam help me out here. So I am still teaching, uh, alhamdulillah, even now. And I also work with preschoolers. And I really enjoy introducing books to preschoolers because it's a whole new world that's being introduced to them. And I start out with, for example, if I had a book like this. This is not a preschool level book. But if I had a book like this, I would start out by going, is this a hard cover or is it a soft cover? And I would also tell them another word for soft cover is paperback. And all the kids would say, hard cover. And then I would ask them, do you know what this is on the, on the book, this thing that I just took off? Most of them will say book cover. But then I'll tell them another word for book cover is dust jacket. And why do you think it's called a dust jacket? Because dust jackets protect the books from dust and also from getting smudges on them. Now, just like you have a name, books have names too. Every book has its own name. And that book is called, that name is called a title. But guess where else the title is? It's not just on the front cover. Oh, by the way, I also tell them, talk to them about front cover and back cover. I tell them about pages, show them the pages and what they're called. Then I talk to them about how every book has a name, and the name is called a title. 
And then I ask them, do you guys know what you have going down your back? And then we talk about what a spine is. And I tell them, you know, a spine helps us stand up straight. If your spine is straight, you stand, stand up straight. But if your spine is curved, you're going to curve over. And they all kind of practice showing them how they can sit up straight and how they can curve over. I'm like, well, guess what? Every book has a spine also that helps it stand up straight. Do we ever want to put books like this on the ground? No. Why not? Because the spine can break. We don't want to break the spines of our books. Then I also talk to them, and I introduce these concepts gradually over the course of weeks in preschool. Talk to them about who an author is and who an illustrator is. An author is the person who writes the stories. You see the writing on the pages? That's the story. The illustrator is the person who draws the pictures. You know another fancy word for pictures? Illustrations. Can the same person be the author and the illustrator? Yes. So that's basically, oh, and then also I, I chose this book in particular because I wanted to show that many picture books will have this sticker on it. Um, if, if you've got quality books in your classroom, they will have this sticker on it. And um, this is the Caldecott Medal. And the Caldecott Medal is the medal given for the best illustrations in a book that year. If it's gold, they were the number place, one place winner. If it's silver, it means an honorable mention. They were close to winning. They didn't win first place, but their illustrations are considered beautiful. And so children are really fascinated with that. And after that, they will be noticing which books have Caldecott medals on them and if they're silver or gold. Thank you. And then the last thing I tell every child from preschool all the way up to high school is that no matter what kind of book you are reading, whether it's a picture book, whether it's a, a detective novel, whether it's science fiction, whether it's a coming of age story, whether it's a memoir, every single book at the end of the day is a mystery. And you are the detective. And the mystery that you are trying to solve is to figure out what is the message in this book that you are being given. And I tell them every single author who writes a book, every single so uh, singer who writes a song, every single movie director, producer who creates a movie, every work of art that's out there, even if it's a painting, the creator of that art has a message that they are wanting to put out in the world. And it is your job to figure out what was the message in this book that I read. And is it a message I agree with? Is it a message I accept? Is it a message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet wasallam are also giving me? Is it a message that my parents are teaching me at home and want me to take, take in and embody? And if not, what do we do? And letting the kids know that not all books are worth reading, not all messages are the messages you want to absorb. So you have to be a discerning reader, right? Okay, and conclude just this part of the talk. Um, there is an author, uh, a man named Jim Trelease, who he came out with a, a compilation of books and he titled it The Read Aloud Handbook. And every four or five years, he would publish a new version of The Read Aloud Handbook. And from what I have managed to gather from his essays that I have read, I think he's a conservative Christian, though he doesn't say it. But everything he says kind of aligns with the values that we Muslims have, mashallah. And so he talks about the value of reading aloud. And he does mention that there is a difference between a good read aloud and just a good book. Not every good book out there makes for a really good read aloud. And so read alouds have very specific criteria. And what he did was every few years, he would release this list of picture books that he thought were worth reading aloud to children. And I loved loved the read aloud handbook. Every four or five years I bought it. I bought old copies. I have every single copy that's ever been published from the 1970s all the way to the 1990s. And he no longer releases those books. I think he's too elderly now. He has a website. But anyway, a few years ago we were talking about it and I was telling Amira about this man named Jim Trelease who's kind of done the work for us and has picked out some really good picture books that we can safely, you know, read to our children. And Amira at that time said, you know, we need something like that for Muslims. We need somebody who's reading books from the Islamic perspective through the Muslim lens and knows whether, 
you know, this book is worth reading to our children or not. And she's like, somebody needs to create it. And I was like, yeah, somebody needs to create it. And that is exactly what these young women have done, mashallah, these four young women. They've, they've been working on it for the past few years. And I'm incredibly proud of them. And I'm so excited to be able to be part of their journey in, in helping them promote, uh, you know, mindful reading for Muslims. And so um, before I conclude, I wanted to just go through some really quick tips about do's and don'ts of read aloud. Are we okay on time? Okay. So um, you want to introduce the title, the author, and illustrator every single time you read a book to your child. You want to remember that your attitude towards the book matters. If you are bored with the book, don't read it. Okay, read books that you enjoy reading because your enthusiasm is going to show. Especially in the preschool age, look for rhythm and rhyme. As a parent, you are going to get bored of reading books that are repetitive with rhythm and rhyme. My husband used to hate reading The Little Engine That Could. But I think I can, I think I can, but every night we would read, I think I can, I think I can, because our kids loved it. And the message in that book was what? That you can persevere, right? You have to have grit, and you, you can do it if you think you can do it, inshallah. You want to look for simple images. Um, again, this is, we're talking about preschool uh, level books. Simple images, not a lot going on. Um, simple sentences and words. As they get older, it's going to get more sophisticated. You want to create a routine around reading. So for every family, it's going to be different. For some people, it'll be like maybe the father reads to the children while the mom is getting dinner on the table. Or maybe the mom reads to the kids when they're in bed, right before they fall asleep. But there should be some routine to reading, OK, so that the kids can look forward to it. And you want to be patient uh, when you see that your kids are fidgeting. And know that they're going to come around, inshallah, they're going to get it. In the, in the beginning, it is hard for kids to concentrate, but they get it over time. You want to read above children's intellectual levels because what studies have shown is that they can't read above their intellectual levels, but they can listen above their intellectual levels. So they can listen to sophisticated vocabulary and uh, more complicated grammar. However, you don't want to read above their emotional levels. And that's honestly, that's a problem I have with some of the Islamic picture books that are coming out. Because some of the Islamic picture books can be really intense. Like a lot of our books are about like battles and wars and, you know, there, there's a time to introduce that. I personally, in Islamic picture books, I love the books that talk about the five senses, that how Allah gave me ears with which I can hear, and then talking about all the different things you can hear, and Allah gave me eyes with which I can see. In the early years, you just want to teach kids about the wonder of the world and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind it all. So you want to avoid long descriptive passages. Um, if you're reading a novel, you want to end on a suspenseful part and end at a cliffhanger so that the kids are eager to continue reading the next day. You want to make it cozy. You can have hot chocolate and blankets. You can read in front of the fireplace. Again, kids, you want them to associate positive feelings with being read to. Let them take their time to look at the pages. If they don't want you to turn the page because they really want to inspect the illustrations, let them. Be expressive. Your tone matters. Um, if it's a suspenseful part, start whispering. If it's an exciting part, start speaking louder. Do different voices for the different characters. And then have a discussion at the end about what was the message of the book. Is that, that was all? Is that oh. OK, take your time. Don't rush through the book. Um, let them, OK, if you've got fidgety readers who have a hard time sitting there, let their hands be busy. Give them paper, give them crayons, let them draw. They will still be listening. And they will occasionally look up to see you know, the pictures on your book, and that's fine. You'll be surprised how much they're taking in. Reading aloud is a wonderful time to bond for fathers and their children. It's an excellent, excellent way for dads to bond with their kids. My husband, he read uh, a, the, the Iliad. He read a version of the Iliad with my boys and taught them Greek mythology. And it took a long, it took like a year to get through all those stories. Um, Aesop's fables, which teach beautiful messages and morals. So um, it's a great time. And then the kids remember it when they're older. You want to definitely limit their screen time. Um, after you're done reading a really great book, like Sarah Plain and Tall, for example, in third grade, you can watch the movie of it as a family, because it's a clean movie. And it's done pretty much true to the book. 
um, but uh, but otherwise avoid you know cartoons and 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 movies and all that. Stick to books for entertainment and invest in that time. Oh, and don't use reading aloud as a bribe or a punishment. Don't tell your kids if you don't finish dinner, I'm not going to read to you tonight. But a reading book should not be linked to anything else except that it's your routine and you do it with your children, right? And that, that's it, okay. So I hope that was helpful and inshallah, I think you're gonna really enjoy the rest of uh, their presentation, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, I have a question. What if, what if like a kid reads a book like Captain Underpants? Like, I've read that book and I'm not really like what what that book is really about. What would happen? What what would be your what would be your opinion on what what the person that? should read? Yeah. Next. Do you want to answer? I want you to answer. Yeah. That's actually a really good question. Um, the best analogy is is that people like to eat junk food, right, and candy, and it's not going to affect you just overnight. But is it good to have a steady diet of junk food? What, what the ladies up here are promoting is like the best of the best quality food. It's, it's the food that's going to make you healthy, that's going to make you grow tall, grow better. That's, that's what these books provide you. They're going to give you good vocabulary. They're gonna, you're going to think about it for a long time. And the messages in them, Captain Underpants, it, it just goes in and out. It's not going to stay with you forever as far as like wanting to inspire you. But there's books out there that when you read them, they're gonna change the way you look at the world. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, the books on this website, many of them, and there's more out there that they're still going through and, get, and sifting through, that inshallah are going to sharpen your ability to see the world around you. But you're right, one book here and there, it's not, you know. You know, one of my duas is that, inshallah, and Allah can make anything happen, but one of my duas is that we reach a point where if a book doesn't get put on the Mindful Muslim Reader website or doesn't get their stamp of approval, that publishers and authors will ask, okay, what do we need to do to get you to include it on your list? What do we need to take out? Just, just tell us the one thing that's going to you know, give us your thumbs up. And inshallah, that can happen. It, it does happen. And, and there, there are communities where restaurants will ser serve halal meat because they know that that's the way you get people to come to the restaurant. So the same can happen with books as well. And one point, uh, I'm sorry that I, I forgot to say in my talk um, that I wanted to say right now, in case there's people out there who are not doing this, please normalize giving books as gifts to children. When babies are born, I, don't, I personally don't give uh, clothes, I don't give toys. Clothes get outgrown, toys break. Books are gifts that keep on giving. They, they don't break usually. Um, Children, even if they quote unquote outgrow them, if they love the book, they're going to want to hold on to it for their own children. It, they get passed down to younger children, to siblings. So books, literally, they keep on giving. They, they're very valued. And, you know, books are, are, are worth a lot. I, I still remember one birthday party I went to where people were giving these huge, like, you know, the, the child was opening his gifts and the toys were really like huge and lit up and they looked fancy. But I personally knew that that toy didn't cost more than like $15, $20. And then there was this one lady who came to the birthday party and she's like, I'm so embarrassed. Like people are giving all these big grand gifts and I just have this one book that I'm giving the child. And uh, the child opened it up and it was this beautiful pop-up version of Alice in Wonderland. I was fascinated. And I noted down the name and the publisher because I wanted to get it for myself. It was a $40 book, right? But it's, it's like books have value. We shouldn't be ashamed of, of showing up with one book to a birthday party. People will appreciate them. So.